So they start taking the supplement and you don't necessarily have the objective controls in there, but the athlete, let's say the performance does start to improve. Now we don't know if that's actually down to the supplement or not. Maybe they, they just improving because they've improved. Maybe they're, you know, a niggling injury is resolved. Maybe um, they've just reached a different point in the season where there's a, just a natural progression. Maybe they're sleeping better. It could be a whole number of different things that cause their performance to improve. But it's this bias that we call post hoc ergo propter hoc. This, this, I, this uh, idea that correlation and causation get mixed up. So you do one thing and and you see a, an outcome that you assume that the supplement improved the performance Whereas actually there's no evidence, there's no direct evidence that the supplement improved the performance. There's, there's a, it's, it's a correlation, but it's not necessarily causation. And so it's so easy to see how, how placebos can become ingrained, but when you have that objective control and you can, you can look at it from a, um, an objective perspective that I think that's crucial and that makes all the difference. Okay, so Nick, just give us give us a bit of a background. People listening that, that might be tuning in, thinking, "Who's this guy?" Um, give us an introduction to you and your career, if you could. Sure. So I come from a kinesiology background. In the states, it's kinesiology, but in the UK, it's sport and exercise science. I did my undergraduate degree at a place called the University of Hertfordshire, which is just outside North London. I stayed there to do my masters, which was more exercise physiology focused, and that was around 2007, 2008. And at, around that time, I started listening to various science and critical thinking podcasts. One of them specifically is called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, which uh, is, is still running. It's a very, very popular podcast. It's It's been going, yeah, well over 10, 15 years now. And for me, that was my first kind of, in, that was my introduction to this movement of scientific skepticism and critical thinking this idea that you should be prioritizing the the, uh, the the process above the conclusions, being open to new ideas and focusing on evidence as opposed to claims. And I realized that this industry that I was sort of starting to work in of health and fitness and wellness is really in stark contrast to this world of scientific skepticism. The two things really didn't overlap, not nearly enough. So I, I started to become interested in using my my newfound passion and interest in critical thinking and skepticism with my pre-existing knowledge of, of uh, exercise science. So I started to, you know, work to try and bring these two worlds closer together. I spent some time at the English Institute of Sport in the UK, which is where I first met you, Steve, yeah, of course. Yeah. And um, for people who don't know, this is the, the service provider of choice to the Olympic performance programs. I left there in about 2009 or 10 to do my PhD in uh, human respiratory physiology in West London at Brunel University. Uh, had various uh, appointments after that as an assistant, then associate professor. And then I moved to Los Angeles to take on uh, a new role, my current role, which is a senior researcher in exercise physiology at Harbor UCLA. And in the past 10 years, really, in addition to the, the sort of the core focus of my research which is exercise and respiratory as i've said i've been trying to bring the two worlds of health and fitness or health and wellness closer together with the world of scientific skepticism and critical thinking and, and a lot of my work over the last 10 years or so has been been trying to bridge that gap uh, sometimes successfully and sometimes not because um, the two worlds are seemingly quite dichotomous uh, which is kind of the theme of the the discussion today so that's yeah. a very brief uh, background into um, into me and what I've been doing. So that's a that's an apt moment to um, to bring into the sort of the topic or, that I'd like to talk to you about about the surrounding around your book, really. So there it is for anyone who's watching: the Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science. Subtitle is always important: uh, confronting myths of the health and fitness industry. Um, so. I'd love to, to unpack a few of the concepts that you cover cover in this and and perhaps replay a couple of the, the key questions that you ask if you if you don't mind sure. but i'd like to pull a, play play around with it a little bit and pull it apart because because i'd find it really useful i've got to say nick i haven't read it fully but i've loved it 
I've really loved it. And that's great. I don't love books. I don't I love a book, you know, and I, you know, I, I like a book and I find bits useful, but I've loved this. So congratulations and thank you for writing it right at the top. Uh, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Um, so, but, but can I just go back to that sort of origin discussion there about what, what, what started to push you to, to listening to those podcasts? What, what, why did you find yourself pursuing communicating about campaigning in this area of questioning and scrutinizing evidence and claims? Because um, most scientists will crack on, but they won't necessarily be um, as adamant about um, calling people out, um, in training people, um, saying, no, this is, this is the right way. We need to be better at doing this. What, what sort of pushed you in that direction, do you think? Well, it was sort of an accidental discovery for me. As I've said, I, I'm, I'm never shy about crediting this podcast, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. I mentioned them in the, in the preface to the book as well, because I, I was originally just looking for science-based content. I was, as an exercise scientist, I was becoming more interested in just general science. I was reading books about physics and uh, um, astronomy, and just I wanted to be as... Uh, you know, as much of a polymath as I possibly could. And so I just was looking for science-based podcasts that would give me new, you know, update me on new discoveries about science and things. And actually this podcast, it is a science-based podcast and they talk about new discoveries in science and, new, and breakthroughs and things. But actually the foundation is critical thinking and skepticism, which as, as I said at the start is about not just accept, accepting claims at face value. It's about prioritizing the process of science above any conclusions that might result it's about understanding your own biases being a good thinker making good decisions in the world being uh, not just scientifically literate but being media literate as well so understanding how the media operate and perhaps the motives behind that and just um, always asking for evidence to support claims that are being made that's kind of I guess the essence of skepticism and so, and and the more I kind of ventured down the rabbit hole, the more I discovered and I started to read books on skepticism. I started to discover people like Carl Sagan and James Randi, who were kind of the, the founders, I guess, of modern day scientific skepticism, looked into the history that um, guys like Socrates, Socrat, who I have here. Here he is. So, you know, he, he was one of the, I, like that. Uh, I guess, the founders of the, the modern scientific method, the Socratic method, which we kind of take for granted these days. But I, I started to look into all of that. And that's when I realized that, um, as, as I said at the start, that there was this huge gap between everything, all the principles that I was learning about as a, as a skeptic, not a cynic, but a skeptic and a critical thinker. And all of these things were really missing from the modern health and fitness industry, where really, you know, marketing is king. Science is subordinate to marketing. There's there's no obligation to evidence or science in the modern in the commercial world, and uh, and and really, we're kind of saturated by big business and marketing rhetoric and that kind of thing. And I just saw how much damage was being um you know caused by people making uncritical decisions and not thinking carefully about the decisions that they were making particularly in the modern commercial context particularly in health and wellness and the profound implicate the downstream implications that, that that can have on clinical practice and medicine and sports performance and the reputation of exercise science as the discipline all of these things are, are negatively affected so that that was kind of my gateway into skepticism and i started i started to write when i was doing my phd in 2012 i started to write articles for a, a few kind of small small scale mainstream magazines and they were paying me for these articles and it was a bit of extra money which was good as a as a poor phd student and um and those kind of early articles that i did formed the basis for the book that I eventually published about eight years later. So that so that all of those ideas had time to kind of marinate and stew in my creative juices, my brain juice. And uh, and all these and all those years later, <laughs> I finally uh, found the the time and the 
the the bandwidth to kind of pull it all together into one coherent um argument yeah that, that's essentially how the book came about and i know that we have a number of coaches who, who listen to the podcast and, and and it was struck me uh reading through um a lot of the 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 chapter titles the content one of the one of the audiences i thought would it'd be great to have this in front of is coaches because to a certain extent um covering the the content as a scientist we go through it go, yeah some of it's a nudge to say i i actually yeah i need to be careful about my biases for example or um i i do need to 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 stay current and relevant about scrutinizing and, and criticizing um any research that comes out there but mm -hmm. but increasingly i think that as the end users of of scientific discovery coaches could be in a position where they're having to make a judgment is, is this hogwash or is this a legitimate breakthrough and innovation that i could use which they wouldn't necessarily get from a paper but they would have to make a judgment and decision as to does this does this warrant space in my in my diary and my time to put an intervention in front of an athlete um so that was one thing i, I that occurred to me and and certainly reading the book it made me reflect on probably some early skepticism in my career where i was probably putting forward a few i say low impact but but um low friction ideas towards towards athletes and coaches and and they and they just didn't really work they just weren't very effective there was a very much a what is this is this it is this the best you've got and it made me just discern a little bit of maybe maybe I should just be thinking about getting back to the basics, doing some of those fundamentally well, and having a higher bar as to what what is um, what I'm going to put forward, because I don't really like some of the reputational damage of putting forward ideas that are shaky, don't have evidence, don't make intuitive right. sense, aren't based on on foundational first principles. And, and that was probably one of the, the the filters that I started to apply quite early. I just don't want to be a chancer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, the, and the, there are two important things that you've touched upon that I want to uh, that I want to unpack. The first thing is that I guess the the theme for the book is that the 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 modern health and wellness or health and fitness or performance world is built on this idea that there are simple solutions to complex problems. And that we we are we have this this machinery this ingrained machinery that predisposes us to the quick fix. We need shortcuts. We're constantly looking for these health and wellness quick fixes, shortcuts to performance: the supplements, the compression garments, the the, the new the new sneakers, uh, the ice bathing, whatever. It's. We we need one quick fix that is going to expedite our performance, and the world doesn't really work like that. You know, you you know better than anyone that the that the performance outcomes that are worth that are actually worth obtaining take time and take effort and they take discipline and you need to think carefully about your nutrition and you've got to get your sleep and these things don't happen overnight it takes a long time to implement it it takes a a, a time and an effort displacement and these so the actual performance gains that are that are worthwhile striving for actually take time to implement so that was kind of one of the key themes of the book the other thing which is a constant battle which um it comes up a again big and sigh again. there nick you had a big yeah. sigh. there's like <laughs> this is this, this, this really big battle <laughs> It's an ongoing, oh, I know, it's, it's, <laughs> because it's exhausting and it's a huge gray area. It's a big gray area is whether it's worthwhile to pursue placebo based interventions. Okay. And this is something that I really want to get your thoughts on, you know, as, as somebody who's who's worked at the forefront, forefront of high performance sport for many, many years, is that as a scientist, I want to retain my intellectual integrity. And I'm like, well, if something isn't proven, if, if something is that hasn't been shown empirically to work, if we don't have a good evidence base for it, then it's it's not something that we should be applying. 
The flip side of that, of course, is that we have these placebo interventions that work in the context of expectation and belief. And now that that could be on behalf of the athlete who's who's going to anticipate performance effects, or it could be to mitigate some kind of chronic pain. If somebody has you know low back pain or benign headaches or something, they can take a painkiller that that works in the context of placebo. They can use homeopathy or something that doesn't actually have an active ingredient, but they might expect it to work. And a, a lot of coaches, and actually this has been studied, if you look at the literature, a, a, a very large percentage, something like 65 to 70% of coaches regularly implement placebo type interventions with their athletes, knowing full well that these things are placebos and that they only work in the context of expectation and belief because they know that these things are going to work. The placebos have very powerful psychobiological effects. And so coaches like to implement them. A lot of athletes, if you survey athletes, they will say, I, I wouldn't mind my coach giving me a placebo as long as it improved my performance. So they don't mind being quote unquote deceived by their coach into taking something that only had you know, psychosomatic effects as long as it improved performance. Yeah, and, um, and, and um that and that's that's the the tricky but that's the gray area. It's like, well, how do we consolidate those two seemingly opposing worldviews? You might be more up to or you almost certainly will be more up to date than me, but I I I think there was some research recently whereby if people were told it's a placebo and administered that placebo, they would still benefit from the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. As in this doesn't work but it it would give you a placebo effect if you took it sure uh, they recognized that's still a placebo and it was still effective <laughs> still... yeah and and, okay. you'd, and you'd lose it you'd get a slight you know diminishment mm. of the of the placebo effect but but these but this thing is is very powerful because there there are night there are meta-analyses that have been done showing that something like 60 percent of the of the performance enhancing effect of caffeine for example as a supplement is is due to expectate is due to placebo so there's a real physical effect of the caffeine as a stimulant it's one of the few supplements that actually works but there's also a potent placebo effect and other studies have partitioned out the placebo effects of altitude into yeah. we were talking about uh, altitude earlier yeah a brilliant study out of the australian institute taking right. taking blood and, and giving blood um mm. yeah fascinating it's, it's fantastic fascinating stuff so they they very briefly for the for listeners who aren't familiar with the study uh, and correct me if i get get, get one of the details wrong but they they uh, put these these athletes through a um a, a live high train low altitude intervention i believe and then they they use phlebotomy to actually extract certain volume of blood so that so the hematological adaptations were actually negated almost entirely and um, and they still found a potent performance enhancing effect even though that they yeah. took steps to uh, make make sure that the red blood cell count didn't actually change pre to post intervention i think i've got that more or less right i think there was actually a much more complicated study than i've given it credit for but um but yeah they were able to partition out the placebo uh, of effects of this thing and we know that um there are all sorts of placebo effects with taking pills and supplements. And even in, I read a study recently where they gave middle distance runners an injection of saline, which is just, you know, an inactive compound, but they told them that it was a potent performance enhancing supplement and their performance, I think improved by 1.5% over three K, which is not insignificant. You know, that's, that's a, a pretty good ergogenic effect. So we know that this that the placebo effect is very important. But there are, but as I mentioned, there are potential consequences to using placebos. One of which is that in high performance sport, of course, if you're if you're investing time and effort and money in using placebos, then you're not spending that those those resources on using interventions that actually have a physical effect. So, is it worthwhile pursuing the placebo, or do we try and focus only on those things that we know? work in a in a kind of an empirical context i don't know that there's a right or wrong answer uh as i said as a well, scientist so where do you where do you stand on that then what's your advice or your your line navigating mm. through the ethical biological financial economic uh decisions that people have got yeah. to make 
Well, I always try and get people to understand the downstream implications of using placebos because, okay, we can we can condone or we can advocate using placebos for high performance <clears throat> sport and for minor medical ailments. You know, if an athlete has a knee injury and you give them some, you know, get, get them to wear a compression garment that we know probably isn't going to help them in, recover from their injury. But if they think if, they, if it helps them to mitigate pain, fine. The problem that we have is that it's impossible to restrict placebo products to sports performance and minor medical ailments. Sooner or later, it's going to bleed into mainstream clinical and medical practice. And there's nothing to stop somebody using a placebo product to fix their low back pain or their knee problem or some inflammation that they have. But what about when that same individual, because they believe so intensely in the healing properties of this thing, what if they try and use the same placebo to cure some kind of serious medical um, problem that they have? Or they get a bacterial infection and they try and use a naturopathic remedy that is only going to um, exacerbate the problem and, you know, most bacterial infections require antibiotics and there are many tragic cases in the scientific literature and in the mainstream media as well of people using placebo medicine to treat very serious medical conditions and people die people lose their lives there are even websites like what's the harm.net which i encourage people to go and check out which has collated hundreds of thousands of instances of injury and death that have occurred following the use of alternative therapies and placebo medicines and so even though the using it in high performance sport okay if, if it works then great if it doesn't work then it doesn't work you know what's the harm but actually there's there's no way to restrict the use of placebos just to high performance sport if we condone it in one facet of society it's going to bleed into all other aspects so that's that's what i try and get people to think about a little bit more and i've written about that extensively and so it's it's just trying to raise consciousness and get people to be a little bit more mindful that actually there are broader implications to the widespread use of placebos. So again, I, I, I don't know that I necessarily um, uh, sit on one side of the fence or the other, but I just want people to challenge the, the, the way that they conceptualize the industry and, and just think about the interconnectedness mm -hmm. between health and wellness, sports performance and medicine and, and the clinical environment, because, you know, what one environment affects the other. Mm. So the, that touches upon the complementary and alternative medicine industry as much as mm -hmm. anything, where sure. a lot of the effects that, and some of them are recognized as positive, but come under the umbrella of, of placebo. Although I do think there is, you know, I'll, I'll try and start this sentence in the right way. So that, um, the, the practice of homeopathy that, that tends to outstrip normal medical practice, a lot of that comes from the care and attention and Absolutely. focus, the bedside manner, the training that comes irrespective of the actual intervention not working at all and, and inconceivable that it could ever have an effect. And that, that makes me think, okay, well, that's, that's at least interesting that that must be applicable to medical scientific support processes, where if you're taking greater care, they, then what you're probably engendering is that enhanced belief, mm. enhanced engagement. And there's some, there's some foundational work around um, the the effectiveness of psychological therapies, and this is, this is quite old work now. Brown, I think it was, who who um, put this pie chart together of the of the influence of a certain therapy, and it it tended to come down to how bought are you in into the practitioner. The actual intervention choice didn't really matter. Mm. It's how bought you were into that practitioner and their and their credibility. Um, so that does lift up a, a whole area of competence about getting people to buy in, create behavior change, adopt practices, and part of that being belief. And I think my my thought on this in terms of sports performance is that it never really fell in 
to this sphere or domain that I was interested in. And I, I never really thought it was, I thought it, it, it certainly came under the banner of chancer. If I start saying, oh, and take this too, um, this is proven safe, but also enhances your performance. And it was sugar pill, for example. Mm -hmm. I just never thought it was interesting. And I also thought that there was probably, I don't, I don't know whether placebo effect would be additive, <laughs> you know, sure. as in we keep giving you different types of sugar pills and we're just getting a 1%, 2%, 5% mm -hmm. improvement in performance. It's just, uh, that sounded nonsense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also recognizing that, that as a practitioner, even though I didn't like wearing a lab coat, even as a practitioner coming into a laboratory, getting special support, there was that Hawthorne effect too about providing people with specialist support that that made them feel a little bit more special about the process, was a little bit more bought in. And then a whole raft of different interventions, whether that's priming warm-up or inspiratory muscle training, that have some evidence if done if done well. And I thought, well, there's enough of a performance enhancing intervention in there anyway. I can't imagine that placebo is going <laughs> to add mm -hmm. on top of that. Maybe it, maybe it would. And that, that, that would be an impossible study to do of having 10 interventions plus a Hawthorne effect to see if sure. placebo could still move the needle on top of that. Yeah, I, th I think that's fascinating because, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree that a big part of I would say probably one of the most important things we're working with athletes and coaches is getting the buy-in. They've got to trust you to actually enact the interventions that you're suggesting. And as you, as you mentioned with homeopathy, for example, I think they get something like two or three times the amount of time. So a patient going to see a homeopathic doctor would get two or three times the amount of time that they would get by going to see their, their regular primary care provider. And so just that care and attention is a, is a big part of the, procedure and so if you can offer that to somebody i think these are important lessons that we can learn and that we can apply to our own practice as scientists and as medical doctors um not always that easy because the resources are not there but i guess we were able to that the tricky part comes when we have to split the difference because trying to bridge the gap between these two worlds is like okay talk about michael phelps I think he's a wonderful example because he's the most successful Olympian of all time, not just the most successful swimmer, but the most successful Olympian of all time in, in history. And he was a, and still is a proponent of cupping therapy. Now, as in terms of, of efficacy, in terms of proven efficacy, cupping is, has about this, the same record as homeopathy in that we know that it doesn't have any direct effect on the body. It works only in the context of placebo. But then when you have somebody like Phelps, who has something like, I don't know, seven or 8 million followers on Instagram alone, and is, and is posting pictures of him getting cupping therapy. Okay, it's one thing if we promote cupping to offset, you know, muscle aches and pains and, you know, whatever, some soreness or to facilitate recovery. But the British Cupping Association recommend cupping for treating asthma symptoms, which is like, that's a bit of a slippery slope, right? And if anybody's listening and they have asthma, please don't try and treat your symptoms using cupping therapy. This is one of those scenarios where you really need to be focusing on evidence-based advice, listen to your doctor, make sure you're not foregoing any mainstream medical treatments because that this, this can cause over harm. And so I, I think um, it. I think it becomes a, a, a. Yeah, I think we're treading on thin ice when athletes they don't realize how much power and influence that they have. Mm. In in um, in disseminating this kind of advice, even unwittingly, because and and I just anecdotally, whenever I see s swimming competitions now, uh, athletes are turning up with with big purple circular bruises all over their backs and shoulders and they never used to before and i can only think that that was phelps's influence 
what's the mechanism of cupping an, an asthma, Nick? I mean, I'm not. I'm. I'm just going to try and freestyle with this now. Are they, are they are they particularly cupping around the diaphragm or um, on the inspiratory muscles? Um, I'm trying to create some nonsense out of nothing. Yeah, I don't. I think um, you're you're thinking too logically and reasonably <laughs> about, about this, Steve. I think that maybe the, it's over the, the thing, mouth. Maybe it's yeah, <laughs> but maybe it could be it. Or um, hypoxia. yeah. So I think the cupping is at its core. It's a it's an ancient Chinese medicine, but it's an energy medicine. So a lot of the terms that they use nowadays, okay. they've repl they've they use terms like blood flow mm. and you know um, helping to stimulate blood flow, but actually you go back 20 years and they were talking about stimulating energy flow. So just like acupuncture is supposed to stimulate energy flow along acupuncture lines or body meridians. And this is all just pseudoscience. It's all just made up science. And, uh, and so I can only imagine that they're talking about facilitating energy flow to cure, you know, some of these medical ailments. I don't think there's a, um, a, a an implied mechanism to it. No. Okay. Um, and um, naughty me for being uh, sarcastic about it. Um, sometimes okay, so, I think sometimes derision is a good way to approach these things. Uh, it's, so you it's, don't get as exhausted. <laughs> well, I, I think if you try, if you take everything too seriously, there are, there are so many of these bunk treatments out there that you have to sort of, it's got to be water off a duck's back. You know, I keep getting emails from uh, uh, a professor of exercise science who shall remain nameless but uh, every time that there's a new product or intervention some pseudoscience thing he, he sends me the link and he's he's clearly losing his mind because he's coming across these things on social media every other day and and i had to tell him look you just gotta you gotta let it go because this is a game of whack-a-mole but every time you 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 try and debunk one thing or talk about the evidence there's a hundred other things popping up to take their place so I think it's more important that we teach skills rather than facts and, and try and try and teach people how to navigate this industry rather than yeah. worrying about every single bogus intervention. Um, and maybe we can come on to that because that, that does sound interesting to me about, I guess this signal to noise here on social media is if we can be bastions for clarity, objectivity, reason, but doing it in a kind way that that has got some weight as opposed to gravity clickbait. So mm. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. But you, you sort of touch upon a concept around that it's always been there, you know, yeah. that we've always had this sort of these bogus claims. I love the fact that you start the book about the origins of snake oil. Could you just tell tell people a little bit about where this sort of snake oil salesman term came from. I, I, I love that. Just, just actually reading it for the first time was, was for me, um, was fantastic. Yeah, I'm reading a, a book at the moment called Quack, Quack, Quack. And I forget the name <laughs> of the author escapes me. Um, and I'm sorry about that. I tweeted about it the other day. Um, it's a wonderful book. And it's all about the, the history of essentially not just snake oil, but the history of false claims. And it goes back to the uh, sort of the 1800s and shows all these old adverts for snake oil and things and it's wonderful but uh, uh yeah i start i start the book with, with the first chapter is called snake oil for the 21st century and this came about uh, there are different ideas and different stories about how snake oil came about this is the most prominent one that i that i found is that when the the transcontinental railroad was being uh, built in the west in the western uh, coast of the united states and and this was in the um in this sort of mid 1800s and the uh, a lot of the workers were um, sort of military veterans and um, and chinese immigrants as well and the the work was very there were long days very arduous work they um they, they were very you know poor sanitary conditions they they didn't get much sleep at all the food was very poor and a lot the chinese immigrants used to 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 kind of cure the um, or to try and cure the muscle aches and pains that they were having and the injuries that they sustained would rub oil from the Chinese water snake into their knees and into their elbows to, to get rid of some of the pain and soreness. And they shared this ancient Chinese therapy with their co-workers and so forth. And before long, this snake oil preparation, so it was quite literally snake oil, was being toured around the United States as some kind of panacea, as, as a miracle cure-all for muscular aches and pains. 
and th this is what if you've ever seen you know old uh, old westerns when when they have these these touring theater companies and they would put on these very theatrical elaborate dramatic shows about you know, some, a man walking up with a cane and then rubs this snake oil onto his onto his leg and all of a sudden he's running around dancing and it's it's this kind of miracle cure and people would fall for it for the most part and this is before the development of analytical chemistry which wasn't really uh, developed until the early 1900s and when they were finally able to look at the ingredients of the snake oil preparation that had been touring the states they found that uh, you know okay it had some some ingredients from the chinese water snake but there was no active ingredient it had camphor in there which gave the gave the 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 uh, balm some kind of medicinal smell and it had i think menthol in there and a few other things that would that would warm the skin so make people feel like that they were receiving some kind of intervention but there was no active ingredient no analgesic that would actually get rid of the pain and so from that point on any product or intervention that was associated with false claims uh, was was termed snake oil and this is the term that is that is now used today and it, it's something that we associate with with snake oil salesmen from the you know late 1800s 1900s but actually we still have snake oil salesmen today they're selling you supplements they're selling you creams that can improve your marathon performance they're selling you supplements that can help uh help you with weight loss they're giving you compression garments which can supposedly you know reduce muscle oscillation or something uh, they're they're trying to get you to wear k-tape which can you know quote raise the skin away from the muscle and improve circulation which is not a mechanism that's ever been demonstrated in the in a, the lab environment so we still have snake oil salesmen around today and part of my job is to teach people how they can evaluate evidence and look for red flags in the marketing rhetoric so that they're not getting fooled and whereas in the 1800s the, the people were getting fooled because of these theatrical touring companies. Now we have social media, which pervades every aspect of modern culture. And we're being bombarded with, you know, tens of thousands of adverts and marketing claims every single day. And we don't have the critical faculties to, to be able to distinguish the fact from the fiction and the science from the pseudoscience. And uh, and this is why we're you know essentially why we have this the problem that we have nowadays where people uh, are making decisions that are not necessarily in the best interest. Mm. Yeah, I love the story. I love the fact that there's nothing in it in there that mm. even if snake oil did uh, have an effect, it's not even in there. Right. Um, it was real snake oil. It came from the it came from the Chinese water snake. But as 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 you said, there was uh, when they actually were able to look at the Act, there was no active ingredient that could possibly have uh, reduced pain. It was just a, a potent placebo effect. It, it makes me, and I'm just recalling a conversation now from maybe nearly 30 years ago now, but I remember my chemistry teacher, A-level chemistry teacher, telling me you don't need, I can't remember the name of the compound now, but, but it effectively creates the bubbles mm. in soap. Um, you need stearate for yeah. the soap. But you don't yeah. need the bubbles. The bubbles are there to make you feel like it's doing something, mm. um, which I suppose is the same as the balm and the medicinal smell um, that gives you that that, that belief. Yeah. And so I, I love the fact that you then build to explore why we take shortcuts. So give us a bit of a, a, an overview as to what is it about our human psyche, our nature, our group think that that wants us to take shortcuts? Yeah, this was the logical progression for me when I was coming up with the the structure of the chapters in the book. So we start we start by I guess raising consciousness, the various ways that we are falling for these shortcut shortcuts and quick fixes, and then I wanted to explore. Okay, well, why are we so? Uh, why are we so eager to fall for these for these claims that are being made so I'm, I'm not a behavioral psychologist but i think in order for us to understand the way that we make decisions we all have to try and understand this area a little bit better mm. and we we have evolved for for navigating hypersocial groups if you think about 
how humans used to that the important survival advantage that we had tens of you know ten thousand years ago when we were hunter gatherers, we survived by by surviving in groups and we hunted and and foraged for our foods, and so the ability to navigate those hypersocial groups to understand the hierarchy and also to predict patterns in our environment, whether that was the weather patterns or tracking uh, you know, animals or so forth. This is how our logic and our reason evolved. It wasn't, it hasn't evolved for modern society, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it's saturated by big business, social media, um, false marketing claims and marketing rhetoric. And modern society has changed dramatically, especially in the last 30, 40 years since internet and social media. But our genes actually haven't changed that much in the last 10,000 years. So our genes, human genes and human lives are now kind of incongruent. So uh, and the, the term that I, that I sort of came up with was this idea that we're using analog critical thinking skills to navigate a digital age. This idea that we... Every every second of every day, we're being uh, we're being we're having marketing claims thrown at us and adverts. And uh, as I said, the average American is exposed to something like ten thousand or so adverts every single day. And we we don't have the critical faculties to be able to determine when we're getting information and when we're getting misinformation or disinformation. So we've evolved for economy. We've evolved for the shortcut for the quick fix. And so any any time where we are required to put in some kind of um, time or effort displacement, we, we try, we come up with any strategy that we can in order to avoid it because we survive it by being economic, by saving, by conserving calories in times of caloric scarcity. Uh, if, if there was some kind of... Uh, energy time profitability ratio to be determined then we had to make those internal calculations okay is it worthwhile traveling over that mountain in order to you know forage for food is it worth tracking that animal for three days in order to get a meal so we, we we've evolved to make economic decisions the problem that we have now in today's society is that most decisions regarding health wellness exercise performance we, we're constantly being offered these shortcuts. Again, take this pill, wear this, uh, wear these sneakers, wear these compression tights, try this training program, do this exercise, try this one weird trick to bust belly fat. You know, these the, the clickbait that we see all the time online is constantly tapping into this economy bias, this economy heuristic that we've evolved. And, uh, and the only way to sort of overcome that is to understand that that is a bias that is being exploited. And to we have to think our way around committing that bias, that fallacy, in order to make the kinds of decisions that are actually going to pan out for us in the long term. And one of the concepts I didn't necessarily see in that section, but I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts on, is the, is the appeal to novelty of it's so much easier to convince an athlete or a coach Here's this new thing, and it's the new bit mm. that that appeals. It creates a hook. It creates excitement. It it perhaps gives some thought that they might be able to get ahead, um, as opposed to some of the other concepts that you come up with about and and certainly recognise about that heuristic based shortcut of, well, I, I I can't overthink everything all day because that's just um, that's that's just a waste of time and effort mm. and i wouldn't ever learn and progress but I'm, I'm keen to get your thoughts on just that that idea of here's the new thing and how prevalent that is as an appeal and perhaps prevents people from being as discerning about whether it is genuinely effective or not mm. well it's this idea that, that we want to try something that's never been tried before that's never been used before because a lot of people, when they're trying to achieve their health and wellness goals, whatever they happen to be, or performance goals, they've often tried a lot of these things. They've tried and they're tried and tested or tried and failed in many cases. And so the idea that there is something that is new and that is novel that they've never tried before 
it's kind of wishful thinking. It's like, okay, well, maybe this is the thing that's going to help me. It's going to fast track me to my performance goals. I think the other thing is that particularly in high performance sport is that, uh, and again, I, I'm keen to get your thoughts on this, is that there is very much an emphasis on performance. It's not so much about taking part. It's about success and performance and winning. You know, if you finish fourth in the Olympics, it's for, okay for some athletes that might be a, a fantastic achievement, but really it's about marginal gains. It's about accumulating every 1% or 0.1% to make sure that you're performing at your, at your optimum. And often that means getting one over on your competition. So is there something new, something novel that I can try that my closest competitor hasn't? And so, and this is tapping in again to one of the, one of the biases that we have, the, the, the it's exploiting an informal logical fallacy, this idea that something that is new and novel is necessarily effective we know that the that it's not necessarily the case everything has to be judged on merit but uh we can't help but think well if if this thing is new and novel then maybe it's the one thing that's going to fast track me to my performance but but uh, i'm keen to get your thoughts on on how that kind of manifests in high performance sport do, do athletes mm. um especially this idea that it's not about taking part it's about winning right so athletes are almost prime targets for these uh for the marketing rhetoric especially surrounding new and novel treatments well i certainly think that in in sports that require energetic effort training they're determined by your physiological capabilities and so most of the time they're really tired um that as they develop through their careers Certainly, if they don't hit success early, I think that there is actually a very healthy level of scrutiny and questioning because they haven't necessarily got the resource or the capacity to be doing everything. Hmm. And, and so I think one of the qualities of some of the best athletes is to be thinking about the value add of a person and an idea and is this really going to be worth my effort because i'm so tired from my training i don't really want to be doing that this and the other um i think that there is um that that perhaps does get bombed when there is something like an ice bath which i've written about presented about was a an early campaigner about this is short-term thinking and might be appropriate if short term thinking is a, is what you want going from a Wednesday night away game to a Sunday lunchtime kickoff that might be appropriate or semi final to final where recovery as opposed to adaptation is important hmm. but um that that means oh i feel better i feel better now um and so i'm able to get on with that training a bit more. I'm able to do a bit more. And so it then starts to spread. It then starts to, to become infectious. People start saying, oh, have you heard? Uh, you should try it. And then they will get that same feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's I, ingrained. It's now yeah. ice bathing is just something that is ubiquitous with high performance. Or it's, or it's sport. a badge of honor too. Mm. Um, put it on my Instagram because it's sort yeah. of aren't I tough and, and I'm doing yeah. the stuff, the hard stuff. Yeah. I credit Hayley Tullett, a middle distance runner, bronze medalist at the world championship in the 1500 meters, probably should have been given gold given who finished ahead of her, but that's a controversial statement. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote about this in how to sport champion that she came back to me to say, look, I'm doing more. I feel fresher. I'm doing ice bars. I'm doing what, Paula Radcliffe and Mo Farah are doing. I'm copying the best, but look at my training diary. I'm doing more, but I'm not running faster. Am I just doing more to get the same effect? Because if that's the case, I don't want to do that. I'd rather do less and get the same effect. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> biologically, I thought, oh, you've got me there. That's mm. interesting. That shortcutting of some of the adaptation process. So, I, I do I do think examples like Haley, where there is a critical mind, 
some of the best athletes that you know they're just questioning you all the time should i can i be bothered to do this you've got to justify it um there's, there's good scrutiny there the other the other angle that i think is relevant is when there's constraints led innovation and when i found myself saying i don't know if this is going to work i can guarantee you nobody else will be doing this um and the example that i i give um and it probably takes some explanation but it's using six minute warm-up exercises for jessica ennis hill in preparation for heptathlon long story short we couldn't do an awful lot of endurance training for jess because that would potentially take away from energy and effort for short explosive events and so i started to think okay you're warming up for six minutes could we manipulate the training intensity of that so that you might be getting six minutes times 10 training sessions 60 minutes of a week of prevailing stimulus and I said, I think this is just a crazy idea. I don't know whether this would work or not. And Jess said, well, um, how would you know? And I said, well, we would know if we tested it. And so that over a year, we found that we were chipping away at that improvement faster and quicker than, than people who weren't uh, using that. And mm -hmm. so that using, using an innovative process of, we don't know if this is gonna work, but let's test it and let's have a control let's be objective about whether it's worth you doing that or not. Um, in that situation, I do think, um, I do think having some objective controls will allow you to be scientific in a world of uncertainty. Mm. And I think that's crucial that, it, that, that you're, you're working with an athlete who's obviously high level athlete who are experienced and who you ha with whom you have that rapport, they trust you as a professional and is receptive to doing some kind of objective analysis to see if it's actually working. And there are lots of scenarios where you'll be working with athletes who are not as not as receptive, maybe don't know you as well, and just want the quick fix. And then you've got to try and balance the two things. And it's very easy in those scenarios to see how placebos can become ingrained within the sport because they want to try a supplement. And you say, well, okay, let's, let's try it and see if it works. So they start taking the supplement and you don't necessarily have the objective controls in there, but the athlete, let's say the performance does start to improve. Now, we don't know if that's actually down to the supplement or not. Maybe they, they're they just improving because they've improved. Maybe they're, you know, a niggling injury is resolved. Maybe um, they've just reached a different point in the season where there's a, just a natural progression. Maybe they're sleeping better. It could be a whole number of different things that cause their performance to improve. But it's this bias that we call post hoc ergo propter hoc, this, this, this uh, idea that correlation and causation get mixed up. So you do one thing and, and you see a, an outcome. And so you assume that the first thing caused the second, that you assume that the supplement improved the performance, whereas actually there's no evidence, there's no direct evidence that the supplement improved the performance. There's, there's a, it's, it's a correlation, but it's not necessarily causation. And so it's so easy to see how how placebos can become ingrained, but when you have that objective control and you can you can look at it from a um, an objective perspective, that I think that's crucial and that makes all the difference, really, to actually using uh, interventions that are that are actually going to work. Mm. And and do you think the fitness industry, exercise, sports performance industry, um, is more susceptible to to some myths and some hocus pocus? Yeah, it's a breeding ground for pseudoscience for a number of reasons. First of all, it's something that people are very passionate about. And everybody is a consumer of health and wellness, whether, whether or not they could be anyone from a high performance athlete who's training, you know, six days a week and two, three times a day, all the way down to somebody who goes to the gym once a week or has tried to, you know, everybody has gone to the gym or, or and or has tried a diet and or has taken a supplement and or as run a park run, everybody at some level is a consumer of health and wellness, whether or not they realize it. Even if you've gone to acu you know, gone to physio to get acupuncture for some back pain, you're a consumer in the health and wellness industry. So this is something that is very personal to everybody. It affects everybody. And 
there is there is absolutely no regulation on the interventions that are put in place. So to give you some some context, it, when when we look at the uh, the processes that underpin the availability of a new drug, you know, a new drug in the clinical world, there has to be a minimum threshold of evidence that the drug is actually doing what it's supposed to. So there's got to be evidence of efficacy so that, that we know that the outcome is intended and there's got to be evidence of safety as well. And so that there are there are preclinical trials that take place in a the lab. There are clinical trials with increasing number of, of human subjects up to you know tens of thousands or more at phase three. All the evidence is reviewed. So there is this minimum threshold of evidence that has to be surpassed. But in health and wellness, there is absolutely no threshold of evidence there are there is no obligation to science or evidence or studies manufacturers can pretty much say and do whatever they like so they can make claims that 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 um that a particular supplement is going to help you lose weight or or a diet is going to improve your energy or a detox is going to help improve the condition of your blood and your liver and by and large there are no consequences to making these claims and when you bring in all everything that we spoke about how earlier about how humans have evolved for the economy for the shortcut uh, and the fact that health and fitness and health and wellness is quite important to most people even if it's just an aesthetic thing people want to look better then that makes us prime targets you know we are walking talking prey to the 21st century snake oil salesman and so it's a huge problem in health and wellness and this industry is worth 4.4 trillion dollars at the last estimation um and it, and it, the industry is built on selling simple solutions to complex problems. Mm. And I, I like the fact that you you draw out this idea that our emotional brain is very poor at making long term decisions. Mm. And so emotionally, if I want to get leaner or feel healthier or or be pain free, for example, that those are or, or sport, follow a gold medal um, opportunity, they're that that will ha carry emotion with it and mm. so probably we are by default in a in a world that is slightly more emotional than as you as you say when you're choosing a laptop for example mm. <laughs> as you give an example in the in the book about you'd go through some steps if you're going to choose your laptop wouldn't you you'd be objective yeah. does it work has it got the right components does it meet my needs well, good marketing is design marketing companies understand our biases better than we do. They are expert psychologists. They employ behavioral psychologists to manipulate the way that we make decisions, right? This is it's not conspiracy. This is this is fact. This is how they work. And because and what they really want is for consumers to be making non-objective decisions. They don't want us to sit down and think very carefully about the decisions that we make whether we're buying a new phone or a laptop or investing in a in a sports training regimen they want us to make decisions with our gut they want to bypass the, those critical faculties and so they will design the marketing rhetoric to to exploit various ingrained biases that we have so one of them as you, as you said is this appeal to anecdote this is why the the before and after pictures that you see on social media mm. particularly on Instagram these things are hugely uh, effective and very very popular because they cut to the core of that emotive bias that we have we all want to believe that that we can have a dramatic transformation in our aesthetic appearance we all want to believe that we can follow this diet or do that exercise and we can go from you know having dad bod to six glistening six pack abs and we all want to believe that we can run a sub three hour marathon on six weeks training and 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 so these these dramatic before and after uh, images, these testimonials as well, very closely related. You go onto any website for a some kind of commercial intervention, there will be testimonials on there rather than scientific evidence. Yeah. Again, it's an emotive argument. They they want they want the the uh, testimonial to be accessible and to tap into these um, you know to pull on the heartstrings kind of thing. And uh, you know another example would be when marketing companies affiliate themselves with successful athletes. So all athletes, all, all high level athletes now are sponsored by at least one or two or more businesses, you know, whether it's Nike or Puma or 
um, any of these big companies, they, they will be sponsoring athletes to wear their brand. And this is because we have a reverence for these high level athletes. We want to be like them. We want to perform like them. And so by affiliating themselves with these athletes, the companies f- affiliate themselves with success and health and wellness and beauty. And so that's what we call the appeal to authority, um, when, whereby you know this, this product is being advertised to us by the medium of this sort of seemingly authoritative figure. And so you know, these are just two of the two of the biases that are exploited uh, in, in day-to-day marketing. And there are many of them. Being a good critical thinker is about noticing when your biases are being exploited. Mm. Yeah, and it, it, that was a section in the book that really jumped out from two points of view. One, about leading and developing teams. Uh, so working with executive teams and teams that uh, businesses that want to improve their performance and it's one of the things you can spot quite early when you go into these environments to to look for what we'd call hippo highest paid person's opinion mm-hmm. and that 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 the, the the conversation will roll and has everyone spoken and it's it's quite free and open and psychologically safe then the highest paid person or the exec will ask will make a point and say i think this and everyone will go well, yes i agree um and that appeal to authority um that that seems to resonate in teams and and that's and that's the essence of of being a good scientist is to okay you question your pre-existing understanding of something review the evidence and if the scientific consensus is that this thing does work if everybody goes away and independently, objectively looks at the data and they all come to the pretty much the same conclusion, that's that's as sure as you can be in science that something has a positive effect, right? That mm-hmm. something is actually working. That's why the vast majority of scientists, particularly climate scientists, agree that climate change is a real thing. It's anthropogenic and it's a real problem. So if you're always going to find scientists who disagree with that, but the scientific consensus of, m- among 98% of scientists is, is that it is a real thing. And so with altitude, that's all you can do is to, okay, this is what we thought the evidence said. Let's question it, go back, and everybody comes to the same consensus. And so this is, a, again, it's another it's a wonderful example of confirmation bias. This idea that you have seemingly two experts, science expert, exercise science, experts who have arrived at dichotomous conclusions about altitude and that's because this the essence of confirmation bias is to look very favorably upon literature that conforms to your pre-existing beliefs and dismiss evidence that that opposes your pre-existing beliefs and everybody is subject to confirmation bias or that there's an absolutist to it, mm. you know, you, yeah. you carefully, uh, I noticed when you introduced the, the concept of snake oil, you, you prefaced, I think this is the origin, you know, you, there was a, a consideration, I might not have quite got this right, or that yeah. 98% certainty of climate change, um, that it's, it's when you feel that there's a, that's the way it is, then I always start to get a little bit, yeah. a bit um, doubtful or thoughtful as to really is that the case? Yeah. Are we definitely sure, um, or is there room for some consideration that things might be slightly different? Well, the key word is doubt, and as a good scientist, there always has to be that element of doubt. And the best that we can do as scientists is to is to come up with a theory not a hypothesis, a theory is a hypothesis that's been supported by all of the available evidence. And then we can we can say with as much confidence as we possibly can that this is the way that, that things work. But there will always be that element of doubt. We can't say absolutely 100% certain for sure, but that's the strength of science is that it's always open to change and to, to being, um, you know, to, to adaptation. It's just that when there is something that is, I don't want to say proven is probably the wrong word, but when something, when there's a scientific consensus for something beyond any reasonable doubt, 
It's just that, and, and somebody comes along who contradicts the scientific consensus. It's just that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So we're, we're, ha we're you know, we, we will happily overturn the theory of evolution if there was extraordinary evidence that was capable of overturning it. It just so happens that the more evidence that we stumble upon, the more evolution gets confirmed as, as uh, mm. the, the theory of how humans exist in their current form. And it, that's the same for any scientific theory. Is But doubt is so important. Good scientists always or will always doubt their own findings. There has to be. Well, well evolution was the was the example that I was thinking of as you were just um, as you were leading into actually saying it, because the theory of evolution as its term mm. is a recognition of scientific thinking that that we think this is how it happened. Yeah. But the the inclusion of the word theory gives. Um, people who don't recognize the, the uh, objective evidence, the, ah, well, it's only a theory. Uh, it gives them the, the, the get out there. Yeah, well, a scientific theory is, is uh, different to how we use theory in the modern vernacular. It's just, you know, when, when you're talking about, I've, I've got a theory that, uh, I've, got, I've got a theory that, you know, the, uh, you know, a ghost lives over the, on the other side of the mountain, or I've got, you know, I've got a theory that it's going to rain today. The way that we use it in a, on a day-to-day -day basis is very different to a scientific theory. A science theory is a hypothesis, which is an educated guess, that has been con confirmed by all subsequent evidence that has that has come about. And so the hypothesis has been upgraded to a theory. And I once saw some creationists uh, attacking evolution, the the theory of evolution by means of natural selection on the basis that it was a theory and not a law. Mm. Well, if it, if it was, if it was absolute, it would be a law. It's like, no, again, this is misunderstanding of the, the scientific vernacular. A law is something that is described mathematically. We talk about the law of gravity, which it can be described and quantified mathematically. Evolution can't be described mathematically, not at least not at the moment. So we call it a theory, but it's, we're sure about, evolution as we can be about pretty much any science um, mm. any, any area of science um but uh we shouldn't be misled about the term theory yeah but i think we digress slightly well well you you've sort of mentioned a few but um for the purposes of completeness how would you be encouraging good principled people to be more appropriately skeptical well i think first people need to distinguish between being skeptical and cynical. So it comes back to this idea of how we use terms and how these terms are interpreted. Being cynical has sort of negative connotations to it that you just automatically dismiss new discoveries as they come about. Being skeptical of something is not to automatically dismiss it. It just means asking for more evidence to support the claims that are being made. So whenever somebody tries to sell you something, and that doesn't necessarily mean selling you something in a store, you know, in terms of a monetary transaction, it could just be they're trying to convince you to their point of view, try this new training program or, um, you know, whatever, see, see my perspective, look upon my perspective more favorably. They're trying to sell you their idea. Just always ask why. Okay, so what evidence do you have to support your claim? Why should I support? why should I believe your claim and always judge the claim on merit. So try as best you can to understand your own biases, because you can bet that the people who are trying to sell you, whatever they're trying to sell you, they understand your biases. And if they're good at what they do, they're going to be manipulating your biases in order to, uh, in order to, to manipulate your thinking and manip manipulate dis your decisions. So the best thing you can do as a critical thinker is to understand your biases understand the way that you make decisions and you'll make more informed educated decisions as a result that's the essence of critical thinking education and uh, and and so by following that process and always asking for more evidence then we stand the best chance we can of investing in interventions that actually work rather than interventions that we think work and um how how do you get on with that nick I mean, you're a champion for this. Yeah. Um, do you still get caught? 
Yes, because you can never eliminate bias. It's not something that you, it's just a part of our DNA. This is how we've evolved and you can't change your programming, but you can mitigate your biases. And, you know, as scientists, if any scientists who are listening, who've ever had to design a, a, a study, you know, some kind of study or you know, research design, come up with this, with a protocol to test a hypothesis, you go through whatever steps you can to mitigate confounding variables. So you, you, you get in, getting people into the lab, you might um, control their diets. You might tell them not to train the day before so that, it, so that it, there are no carryover effects. You might ask them to stop taking any supplements they're taking, whatever it is, because you know that these things can affect the outcome that you're testing. And so you just got to look at every scenario, every decision that you make with, okay, well, what confounding factors could there be here? And you never get it 100% right. And I still find myself going into, if I do a literature review for a new commercial sports product, I, I I can always sense that there's something in me that that you know I want to find a certain outcome. Either I really want it to work or I really don't want it to work. And you can't ever get rid of that. You just have to mitigate it as much as possible. Be aware of those sensations. Be aware of those feelings, and be as objective as you can. And um, I think as long as you can approach the decisions that you make with with that kind of self awareness then you're doing everything that you can, I guess. Mm. We're only human after all. We're not robots. And, you know, we're not um, we're not Spock who's capable of only, you know, logic uh, or um, Mr. Data, any Star Trek fans out there. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we're we human and we, we're subject to these biases, but we just have to recognize them and mitigate them. I'm now wondering whether that um, head of Socrates you've got on your mantelpiece there, I'm wondering whether that was sold to you uh, online with an advert <laughs> because you were um, you were searching for Skeptic's Guide to the Galaxy and uh, was it Universe? Sorry, and yeah. um, and thought and you were fed that by an advertiser. You thought well, that would be lovely just to remind me that I'm it's I'm nice and, and skeptical, and it was an emotional it, buy. <laughs> in, in in this case, I can I can I got this actually when I I visited Greece. Uh, I went to Athens, and they've got. They've got loads of different. Oh, Socrates you booked a flight heads. to go and get it. Yeah, exactly. It was I was money. so desperate. <laughs> exactly. I know. <laughs> they really, they really got me. <laughs> so, and actually, it's it's important for me. It reminds me that uh, the scientific method is the best method that we have. Morning. Yeah, exactly. Give me a little kiss on the forehead. It's the best yeah. method that we have for making informed, educated decisions about things. Just and, a little reminder. And so then, stretch that for me a little bit. Um, what advice would you give to applied scientists who who are trying to utilize that information and the the control aspect of any intervention is impossible it's noisy it's dynamic it's complex um and so trying to infuse in, in increased objectivity into their thinking what advice would you give to to them who are trying to make a difference trying to make that leap of faith as well well, I think everybody would agree that the best way to achieve an outcome, let's say in this case, it's sports performance, is to apply interventions that we know work. So the best way, and in fact, the only way to do that is to take an evidence-based approach, just to be objective and to make sure that we're judging these interventions on merit. So regardless of placebo effects, if something, if something is, a, if it actually works so that we can use caffeine as an, as an example, it's a stimulant that works, but athletes take it expecting it to work. So there's going to be a, be a placebo effect there as well. So maybe actually the best way from an applied perspective is to implement interventions that we know actually work and that we expect them to work as well and, and that way we can sort of balance the best of both worlds we can we can help our clients and our athletes achieve their their health and performance outcomes without sacrificing our intellectual integrity in the process maybe yeah. that's probably the best way forwards mm. and um so yeah i mean the build on that for me is do the basics really well and that's that probably does speak to renewing the way that you communicate phasing the way that you focus the attention because 
that novelty aspect of let's just do the shiny things or the shortcuts um, does draw away from just do the fundamentals to start off with. Um, but it's boring. Um, mm. It is boring. It's mundane for a lot of people, some of which one of the qualities I think actually makes a, a real champion is that the ability just to do do the mundane things really well. It's the hard grind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well I, I think that that's absolutely critical because even if you apply interventions that work, that are proven, that are shown to be effective, you might get what? one two three percent additional performance you take a supplement that's really powerful and that's really potent that really works you might get a couple of percent improvement or an altitude intervention is the same but actually the day in day out the daily grind of getting your nutrition right getting your sleep right getting your optimizing your training program you know all of these and you know tapering recovery all of these things getting as you say getting the basics right that's 95 96 97 percent of your performance advantage right there if you're not doing that right none of the other stuff matters and so whenever whenever i've worked with nutritionists for example in the past it's like okay before you even start talking about supplements with with uh with athletes uh, no supplement is going to make up for poor diet and no compression tights are going to make up for poor sleep and uh, no altitude intervention is going to make up for uh, insufficient training program. So getting that basic stuff right, that's 95% of your battle. None of the other stuff matters until you get that stuff right. So in chapter eight and nine, you take on different products and practices. Um, any that you'd like to take um, down a peg or two um, now? I'll, I'll give you a little opportunity. I mean, Nasal strips, electrical stimulation devices, power bracelets, power bracelets. I didn't, that sounds like something you get in a computer game, but um, <laughs> uh, you know what, actually, Nick, I'll, I'll confess. I had a flirtation with electrical stimulation device manufacturer. Mm -hmm. When I first started supporting champions, I got approached. So I've, I've just taken the leap of faith. I yeah. don't know who's going to pay me next. And I get an email, would you be interested in being an ambassador? I was like, oh, really? Mm. Um, okay, well, send me, the, send me what the, the product is. And it was like, you know, ab burn product or, you know, um, belly away type thing. There's some, some silly names to it. And, um, and I said, oh, look, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this. And they said, well, we'd love to get you to, to advise some of our research and be on our website and provide an endorsement. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. I don't know. Um, well, you know, it's a six figure sum. I'd like you to consider it. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about it more carefully now. <laughs> and I said to, I said to Rachel, look, I, ca I can't do it. Um, it it's, it's just shaky. It's trying to sell um fat loss spot spot reduction um it's nonsense I, I don't think i can do it and and rachel's like no look stick to your principles stick to your values you know you're a scientist ultimately and your reputation is what we need to maintain and that's and i was like okay yeah that's fine I'll, I'll tell them i can't make the date with cristiano ronaldo and i went oh, hang on a minute hang on a minute <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a family invite for that brilliant <laughs> so i'm guessing you didn't i'm guessing you didn't go for it in the end didn't do it didn't do bravo it. bravo steve because a lot of people in your position would have and uh and i think that's you you prioritize your intellectual integrity above above the six figure sum yeah we just ate baked beans for the first year of, yeah. of supporting <laughs> champions so so yeah any anything you'd like to have a little uh pop at any anyone that you'd take a that particularly frustrates you? Well, I, for me, the most frustrating one is it's not really a product. It's, and it feels a little bit like shooting fish in a barrel because I'm always complaining about chiropractic. But it's because I've done a really deep dive on the literature for chiropractic. It's, it's really pervasive. It's used in a lot of places. A lot of athletes use chiropractic. And it's almost synonymous with physiotherapy. If somebody get, has a sports injury, they'll often think, oh, okay, well, I'll, I better go and see a chiropractor. And so it's 
chiropractic has managed to snake its way into mainstream practice. And actually, when it comes to uh, as coming from somebody who's done a really deep dive on the literature, and I did so without anticipating what I was going to find, I've never before seen such a disparity between the claims that are being made for chiropractic and the evidence in support of the claims. So, ju so just give me anyone who's listening thinking, oh, I thought they were the same. Mm -hmm. Distinguish the two for us. Well, physiotherapy would be, you'd go and see somebody who's a qualified physiotherapist who is trained to understand mechanisms of bodily injury. Often you'll see a sports physiotherapist who will understand specifically the mechanisms of sports injury. And they will use their understanding of, of uh, the musculoskeletal system to help you to address the injury and to rehabilitate you. Chiropractic in its in its conventional form is specifically about spinal manipulation so this idea that all bodily ailments whether it's headaches or and migraines or back pain or um, you know, any kind of uh, that there are claims that chiropractic can treat all sorts of illnesses and diseases all stem from misalignments of one or more vertebrae in the spine and so the chiropractor will then manipulate the spine Sometimes you get a nice, loud, satisfying crack of the spine or crack of the neck. And it's claimed that, that this can it, it help to you know, relieve tension and uh, pent up energy. And there's claims to, to detoxification and this kind of stuff. The chiropractor was developed in the 1950s, I believe. It's, it's not an ancient Chinese medicine. It's actually much more modern than that. And it's based on very shaky scientific principles. But there's, there's no mechanism of action here. And when you look at the, the reams of literature on this, it doesn't work for anything. If you look at the, even normally you'd say for things like acupuncture, you would say something like looking at the better, high quality, well-controlled studies, it shows it doesn't work. And some of the less well-controlled studies show that maybe it's beneficial, but we've got to focus with chiropractic. Even the crappy studies show that it doesn't work. <laughs> You know, there's, there's uh, maybe a little bit of stuff in there for back, low back pain, but if it does work for low back pain, it's no more effective than rest or painkillers or normal physiotherapy or just going for a walk. Mm. But, but the claims that are made for chiropractic, that it can cure disease and cure illness and improve headaches and improve back pain and uh, all of these crazy, ridiculous claims and the evidence is absolutely poultry it's awful it doesn't work for anything and when you see the ubiquitousness with which chiropractic is embedded in in mainstream culture it's used in sports teams and um, many uh, professional sports teams have chiropractors on their payroll and lots of physiotherapists practice chiropractic they have their own chiropractic schools you can get a, a phd in chiropractic and, they, you know, you have doctors of chiropractic and they call themselves doctors and they talk about how um, they, they sometimes deliberately play on this idea that, they, that they're that they confused with medical doctors a lot of the time as well. And, uh, and that's a real bugbear for me because chiropractic is not just ineffective, but it's also very dangerous. There are lots of cases in the media and in the scientific literature of major injuries and um, broken necks. Uh, strokes that have been caused by incorrect chiropractic manipulation, neonate chiropractic where they where they've um, where they'll crack uh, the necks of newborn babies. Mm. They have they have uh, animal chiropractic, and it's just it drives me crazy. This is one of the things. It's a it's a real nerve. It really, really stri strikes a nerve with me. Um, it's just the fact that the the evidence is so poor and the claims are so bold. Mm. Uh I mean, yeah, that's quite fascinating that you can do a PhD in it. And presumably mm. it's the history of it or the um, the social impact of it, the availability. It's like an ethno, an economic study of it as opposed to the science of it, I'm, I'm assuming. Well, I, I, to be honest, I've not looked in, in to, into the curriculum that they... Uh, but I think this is more for practitioners. So this is for people to learn the applied, quote, science of okay. chiropractic and how to be a better practitioner but of course the science is made up so i just think 
degree. Okay, so it's referencing pe- bogus material. Anyway. Yeah, for sure. Right, okay, these yeah. PhDs are not worth the paper that they're written on. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think chiropractic for me is a is a is that's a the real one, is it? Bear. That that gets the yeah. room one hundred and one. There's quite a lot of them, to be honest. <laughs> Don't get me started because I've probably got a long list of things that I could I could start talking about. But that's that's close to the top of the list. Okay, so I mean, just a couple of last questions then, because this is uh, I've clearly riled you. Sorry, I shouldn't have asked you. Um, <laughs> I should have kept it nice and now. steady. But but what I'd noticed is that on certainly on social media, Twitter, and, and so on, I, you know, I follow your account and the, the communication that you're creating. But um, I'm inspired by a recent uh, post that you you put up, I'm just reading it now, when tackling health and wellness and misinformation online, this is what you regularly have to deal with. And so there's a uh, an image of a of, um, of a somebody walking backwards 100 steps backwards is equivalent to a thousand steps and and then you said thanks laurie a fascinating tweet do you have the references for the research papers that report these walking findings hi nick no but on youtube this bloke uh talks about it so i mean it's it's quite fun but i'm i was also struck by how polite and um curious you were you weren't just calling this out as BS straight away. You were giving them an opportunity. I mean, how have you managed yourself in this bro science, pseudoscience, gobbledygook science world to try and influence some of the snake oil salespeople to be more discerning? Mm. Well, for full disclosure, it wasn't actually me who asked the question. It was just it, coincidentally, it was somebody else. Oh, was it? I was, I, yeah, oh, yeah. I see. But, but, but actually, it is the same way that I would have approached it because the the, the minute that you attack somebody online, they just shut down. It doesn't it, not just online, but if you attack somebody's pre-existing beliefs, nobody wants to be wrong. Everybody's got an ego. Uh, scientists are no exception, and if if you start telling somebody that they're wrong then people become defensive and and the the opportunity for logical discourse is lost it just, people just shut down and you're not going to get anywhere so the best thing that you can do is to be polite and respectful and i would expect people to to reciprocate i'm happy to engage with people online if they're polite and respect it's fine if you want to disagree with me that's absolutely fine i'm used to that but be civil and then we can engage in some logical discourse uh, I, you know, maybe we can move things forwards in a meaningful way. But if somebody is rude or obnoxious or they're just trolling, I just don't engage with them. I, I don't give them it. I don't give them my time because if you disagree, then in, in this case, okay, this is great. Very interesting. But do you have any evidence for this? And that's exactly what I would have written. And it's a real problem that that we see that the typical response is, no, I don't. But here's something that somebody said on YouTube. So YouTube is not evidence. And the the main the main issue here is that this lady, uh, Laurie, or whatever her name is, she's uh, her profile is listed as a health expert. She's got a PhD. I don't know exactly what in. She's a she's a multiple time best selling author, and she's got 123,000 followers on Twitter. And she made this statement that walking, did you know that walking backwards 100 steps, retro walking, is equivalent in terms of energy expenditure as walking 1,000 steps forwards? And actually, I looked into this because I'm thinking maybe there is some, maybe she's referencing some weird, you know, study that's found that, you know, the t- tenfold difference in energy expenditure. Yeah, it's, but, pl- but it's actually, plausible in that sense it, of, you know, if I if you did a side step, two hundred side steps, it right. might it it, w- it would be tiring. Right, it's it plausible. Yeah. If you're walking backwards, it's not going to be as economic. You're probably going to engage different muscle groups. There's a coordination aspect. Fine, but actually, what she referenced there was literally folklore. It's just some Chinese folk tale that uh, you know a, a Chinese monk once uttered that walking a thousand st- well a hundred steps backwards is the same as walking no, a thousand okay. steps and it's been co-opted and misappropriated <laughs> and now people are now even if she knows that it's just folklore her, the 123,000 followers that she has 
don't necessarily know that. People think that she's being literal. Maybe she thinks it's literal, but the fact that it's folklore is is that's important. That's an important distinction. And and so yeah, this is what we have to deal with when mm. when you create good science, it takes months, years to generate, you know, to collect the data, to look at it, look at it objectively, to do robust statistics, to write the paper, get it peer reviewed, get it published. Whereas somebody can come up with some bullshit claim about hundred steps walking hundred steps backwards or or anything else and they can tweet it out to their hundred and twenty thousand followers and uh and you've got you've got no kind of recourse this is why misinformation and bad science spreads much further farther and deeper on social media than the good science than facts and figures mm. and so yeah th this is what we're sort of dealing with it's um it's an uphill struggle so um the late great Ed Winter, who was, mm -hmm. I'm sure you would have um, known very closely at, yep. at Sheffield Hallam. I loved his phrase. There's no such thing as bad science. It's either science or not. It right. has to comply <laughs> with yeah. scientific principles. So um, there's a the couple of things that you've just said there have, have lifted a, some thoughts. The, the other one, I looked, her PhD is in psychology. And right. I think you mentioned it in the book, I can't pinpoint it now off the top of my head, but that you should scrutinize the quali relevant qualifications and accreditations of people. And if they are giving you nutrition advice and they're a medic, for example, then probably not qualified, mm. but vice yeah, versa. Yes, it, yeah, exactly. And there, you, it, it, exactly as you've said, you've got to look at the, the or any authority is are they a legitimate authority? Do they have the relevant qualifications? I would never dream about, you know, I have, a, I have, I have three degrees and lots of experience in, in my field of study, but I would never dream of getting on a plane, knocking on the door of the cockpit and start giving advice to the pilot about the best ways to take off and land the plane. When the stakes are high enough, I shut my mouth. Or uh, I would never, I had a, a surgery on my shoulder some years back because I, I had an anterior dislocation and I would never start telling the surgeon about the best place to, you know, make an incision. Mm. And and yet um, everybody seems to be an expert on health and wellness because apparently the stakes are not high enough. But even then, um, you know, would you take health and wellness advice from somebody with a PhD in biology? Well, again, why you probably don't need to because there are people with PhDs in exercise science and nutrition and physiology who are, who are more appropriately position so in this case mm. phd in psychology well how does that make you a health expert yeah um i had a, i had a message the other day from a guy called troy taylor who was um who works out in the us in a silicon valley based uh, startup looking at developing um resistance-based home home um devices advanced almost like a resistance equivalent of peloton and he flagged Look, Peloton have got this new rowing machine out, and part of their marketing material is that they claim that rowing, rowing will utilize eighty-five percent of your muscles, and and so, and I thought, well, yeah, it's not, it won't be that much, but it would be high, um, but it's sort of the ultimate workout. And Troy had done some digging and looked in at um, finding the the marketing material associated with it. And I was referenced and, and he went off and looked at the paper that I'd published, which was about the oxygen kinetics during rowing. And it wasn't to, to do with 85% of muscles being used. It was the slow component for which, and we're now getting into technical terms, but the bit at the top effectively, once your oxygen uptake starts to try to plateau, that there's, a, there's an extra bit that starts to increase, your oxygen starts to drift upwards that slow component, that 85% of that derives from the working muscles. And Peloton have just run with it. <laughs> just, wow. we're, it we, it's, it's, not even, it's not even accurate. They've just gone for the, yep, Ingham said. Um, and it wasn't even my study that researched that. I, I was quoting somebody else who, who, who had that, found, that finding. So it, it is that sort of, indirect 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 whispers 
that mm. sounds legitimate because it's got a reference at the bottom um, as opposed to you're questioning that evidence base on a routine routine basis. It's like this this the game Broken Telephone that you play as a kid. You know, you whisper in some phrase yes. in in somebody's ear, and then they whisper it to somebody else, and and you see what it comes out as at the end, and it's usually it bears no resemblance to what it started as. And uh, this is common. You see this a lot in health and wellness marketing. Again, because there are no strict regulations, they don't have to reference things at all. But often companies understand, especially if they're if they're dealing with endurance type of sport, because they know that endurance athletes and coaches, they like a bit of science, they like a bit of evidence. The the sport is is heavily dependent on physiological adaptations, as we know. And so they do see the need to to appear to be scientifically valid, but they know that most people, by and large, are not going to scrutinize when you know if they give off a reel off a list of references most people are not going to look to see if those references are valid mm. so normally the literature is tenuously related you, you see this a lot with for example compression garments which i've mentioned a few times and some companies sell compression socks and compression anklets which li literally just go over the ankle and if you click the the button for research on the website they will link to research on whole body compression you know or or full mm. lower body what's compression. next a big toe compression yeah exactly just right it's a smaller and smaller volume of body <laughs> that's being compressed. compression and so, the oh, literature sorry, I've been is... sarcastic again, again sorry 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 no that's fine it's, they, it's they... like it's a healthy response and the literature is is very tenuously related and sometimes you know i saw it recently with uh, a, a canned a canned oxygen supplement so this is exactly yeah. as it sounds it's a spray can with a mouthpiece that you take a deep inhalation of and you do it periodically throughout the day and it's supposed to give you more energy and improve concentration and you do it before sports performance etc and there's no evidence for this but when you click on the the research tab the literature tab they link you to research in supplemental oxygen in a in a patient setting Right. You know, if you if you give a patient with acute respiratory disease supplemental <clears throat> oxygen, it will improve their oxygen levels, help them breathe. Well, that's that's a different scenario. That's a patient who is breathing supplemental oxygen for 30 minutes on, you know, high flow or high pressure oxygen. This is not what that is. This is a completely different thing. And actually, it's worth mentioning that one of the manufacturers for canned oxygen created a press release that they mocked up to look like a scientific journal article. So they've, uh, they've created wow. a press release. It's basically a headline, but it's, but it's a title and they've got authors there and they put it in split columns and some graphs in there. So it has the appearance of a scientific journal article, but actually it's a press release. So it's it really shows how unscrupulous these, uh, these manufacturers can be, but yeah, going back to your point, it often it just, any link to literature is considered to be enough, but the literature is often very tenuous. I bet you couldn't find the conflicts of interest at the bottom. No conflicts <laughs> of interest. There were there were two references, I think, two or three references, and one of them was a website, their own website, and uh, what gave it away was that there was no uh, there was no journal title on there. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, you and, would get the journal yeah, industry could, attacking right. them. That would take them down. And and some of the other things you, you've seen is, uh, again, it's just uh, going down down the rabbit hole, but it, it's, this is important for people to understand how unscrupulous product marketing is and, and how there's really no obligation to any anything scientifically valid is um, often people will make up references and they will make up journal articles and put on well-known authors. So I don't know if this has ever happened to you, Steve, because you're quite widely cited, but uh, that they will use well-known authors and just put their names and affiliations on press releases or journal articles that have been completely fabricated. So this happened to Mark Burnley, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm. And, um, and his name was featured on a, on a paper that he had absolutely nothing to do with and for, for some kind of oxygen supplement. And it was literally just fabricated for the purpose of, of selling this, this uh, in, you know, very poorly ref poorly uh, evidenced intervention 
and uh and and people were just sort of hang on did did you were you involved in this study he was like this is nothing to do with me they've Mm -hmm. literally just used his name and affiliation to to give the product some scientific legitimacy so that's happening with increasing frequency as well terrible stuff no look i can see i've got you emotional again and you started you started rubbing your forehead. passionate not emotional you, passionate. Start, you know you were holding your head at one point then. <laughs> that's true actually exacerbation look thank you for writing the book congratulations on it and you, i'd Steve. encourage any scientist coach um anyone at the bus uh waiting for the bus i'm gonna i'm gonna tell them to get to to go out and read it um where can people follow along um you meant we mentioned that you're on twitter um but you've got blogs and sites could you let us know where best place to find you sure reach out to me on twitter at nb tiller tweet about exercise sport performance critical thinking all the good stuff and all of my work including the link to the book and the column that i write for skeptical inquirer i write another column for ultra running magazine you can link to all of that stuff on my website which is nbtiller.com and you can keep up to date with uh, all of the too many projects that i have going on fantastic well look thanks so much for for sharing your thoughts sharing the, the passion that you you have for this to to make things better um so that we can help people with things that are genuinely effective or useful or interesting um so thank you for for campaigning in this space um it, it means a lot to us all so thanks nick no thank you i appreciate it thank you for the kind words and thank you to you also for sh- for shining a light on this stuff because uh, it's it's through mediums like this that we actually can help to raise people's consciousness in exercise and sport and health and that that's really what we, we it's a collective effort so thank you to you but that was a lot of fun thank you for having me yeah, when the podcast goes out, then all of this is just going to, you know, we're going to solve the whole area. So that'd be fine. We're going to put the, put the world to rights. <laughs> hope so. Fantastic. Great. Cheers, Nick. Uh, cheers. Cheers, Steve. That was great. Superb.